Uh, welcome everyone to Riders for the Sea. It's a Blue Frontier project. Our last live event was held in Boulder, Colorado in 2019. So this will be our second online pandemic webinar today with three of the group's better known authors, Sylvia Earle, Brian Scarry, and Carl Safina. Rather than say they need no introduction, I'll just keep it short. Um, if you post your questions under Q&A, Natasha Benjamin of Blue Frontier should be able to uh, get a few of them to us at the last 10 minutes or so. Um, first, I, I know you'll wanna hear what our, our writers have to say about writing photography, our mother ocean, and of course, we wanna sell hundreds of their books. So um, in terms of who's who, Brian's a world-renowned National Geographic photojournalist and storyteller specializing in marine wildlife. He is the uh, author of 12 books, including Ocean, Soul, and Shark. His latest Secrets of the Whales will be released next month. Wow. Sylvia, her deepest, is a National Geographic explorer and residence, former chief scientist for NOAA, deep sea diver, Time Magazine, Hero of the Planet, much, much more. Her upcoming National Geographic book is Oceans, a Global Odyssey. Also, the 25th anniversary edition of her classic book, Sea Change, will be out next week. And Carl's an ecologist and MacArthur Genius Fellow, founder of the Safina Center at Stony Brook University, where he's an endowed fellow. Among his very popular books are Song for the Blue Ocean and A View from Lazy Point, and his most recent bestseller, Becoming Wild, How Animal Cultures Raise Families, Create Beauty, and Achieve Peace. So why don't we all start with something we all share, which is this terrible pandemic year that hopefully we're coming out of, and how it's affected your work and your writing. Sylvia, you told me you traveled the world more in 2019 than ever before, and you travel a lot. So World Oceans, a global odyssey, uh, could it have been written if you were not forced to stay home this year? Oh, it would have been written, but maybe with not the same depth, dare I say, <laughs> because I did travel a lot in 2020, but it was all by Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to more countries than ever before, mm -hmm. attended more meetings than ever, but I also had the great opportunity to sleep in my own bed. It's a wonder what sleep actually does for being creative. So I think the, the book probably benefited from the pandemic and probably I did too, especially since I didn't catch the bug or not yet, maybe never. Get vaccinated, uh, Sylvia, we need you. <laughs> Nothing says social distancing like scuba diving, of course. So uh, how's your last year gone, Brian? Huh. Um, yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, well, it's it's gone as well as can be expected, I suppose, all things considered. Very fortunate, um, you know, to, to be here sort of on the coast of Maine. Um, I had gotten a new story approved uh, by National Geographic just prior to the pandemic. And it was going to be a it is a story about the Gulf of Maine, uh, which is the body of water that extends from Cape Cod up to Nova Scotia, Canada. So for the first time in my career, I wasn't going to need to really get on a plane to travel for field work. And um, turns out that, that that ended up being a good thing. So I was still able to work on, on that project, uh, still continuing to work on that. And this latest book, Secrets of the Whale, which is Secrets of the Whales, which is um, a book and a, a cover story in National Geographic magazine and a, a four-part Disney Plus documentary series, all got moved up a year. It was all supposed to really um, debut originally in 2022, and I got a call, I guess, last spring that said we want to move it up. So, um, in the middle of doing the Gulf of Maine work, I had to burn the midnight oil and write this book and, um, and do all the other things, but it all worked out really well. And um, yeah, here it is. It's, uh, it's 2021 and it's all being released. So yeah, thanks. Well, that's, that's really something of a project. I, there's a word for like something that really is tremendous and exciting <laughs> animal. Whale of a project, maybe? maybe. <laughs> nice. Our Never let a good cliche go by. Yeah. Carl, um, I know you've been home for a year and I don't know if it relates to your next book or not. Why don't you let us know that? It relates very directly because um, all the books that I've done involved a lot of travel. Most of them involve going to at least three continents. And in 2020, 
everything was canceled and I didn't go anywhere except stay home, which was okay with me actually. But it coincided with an interesting event because in, uh, in 2019, we raised this little orphan screech owl. And when we released her, uh, after introducing her very slowly to the environments around the immediacy of our backyard, when we released her, she stayed around. And in 2020, she got a wild mate. They nested in a box that I put up right on the outer wall where my writing table is. So they were about four feet away from where I type. And they raised three chicks. Um, you don't usually get to see owls doing their thing, but this was really extraordinary because a completely tame owl allowed me to watch at very close range every day for a couple of hours in the morning as dawn was coming up and a couple of hours at night. Uh, all of the stages of their courtship, um, all of the stages of her incubating, feeding the chicks. I could sit under the nest box while they were bringing food in and all that kind of stuff. So the book that I am working on right now is based around that story and woven into that story is how humans have seen their relationship with the natural world over the course of human history, pre-recorded and recorded. Um, how indigenous people have seen their relationship, how Eastern people, uh, East Asian people, and, uh, and Western civilization and the enormous differences and the consequences of those differences. So that will be woven in through this very sweet story of this little owl raising her babies in our backyard. <laughs> and and at, although me, most of my other books involve going to three continents, all the action in this book happened within about a 150 foot radius. So <laughs> awesome. I, I gotta say, what a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> So the other thing I've always said is the one resource not fully exploited in the ocean is good storytelling. So two of you are scientists, Brian, you're working class kid from the suburbs of Boston. Um, I pretend to be a scientist, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when did you first realize you wanted to tell your ocean stories through book writing or, or photography and photo books? I mean, what, what brought you all to books? Let's start with Sylvia again. <clears throat> Sharing the view. You know, it's one thing to go down and see extraordinary things. And, but if you keep it to yourself, that's no fun. <laughs> and now that sense of joy of sharing is coupled with a sense of urgency. Because having the privilege of being able to spend thousands of hours underwater over many decades, I've been a witness to change. Some of it is good. There are more whales today. Brian, you can attest to that. Mm. A few yeah. decades ago. Why? Because we haven't totally stopped killing them, but a lot of countries have really pulled back. And generally, we over the world have come to view whales with new respect and treat them with greater dignity sure. and value, all the rest. So the same is true with sea turtles that once were just something to eat, including their eggs. And Carl, you wrote eloquently about what it's like to be a turtle out there in the ocean. And I, they can't speak for themselves. So I think it's our role in part to be a voice for those who have no voice. And, and I, <laughs> as a scientist would dearly love to be spending more time just being a scientist, which is, by the way, I mean, I, I look at Brian as an accomplished scientist as well as an accomplished photographer. Why? Because he observes carefully and he reports honestly what he sees. And photographers often have a way of seeing that many scientists miss. It's that attention to detail. It's that understanding of how things work together and patience, oh, patience to be able to do what Carl has just done to look closely and deeply into 
into how nature really functions. And I've seen Brian in action and Carl in action. <laughs> and I aspire to have that same kind of, you know, just empathy, empathy that enables us perhaps to share the view with images and with words. Was, was Sea Change your first full on narrative book that you did? Out, yes, I, I've, done, I've done five kids yes. books. <laughs> and I, I had done two National Geographic productions before I did Sea Change, but Sea Change gave me a chance. I, I had three years to do it. And the other books I've done are, you know, hurry up, like, <laughs> like Brian, you've got to get it out now. <laughs> and deadlines, deadlines. And they're not that Sea Change did not have a deadline. It's just that it kept slipping a bit. And that was okay at the time. The, the other one that was more narrative in nature, first person, was The World is Blue. Mm -hmm. It was published by the National Geographic. Sea Change was a Putnam production. Um, after that, I've been mo largely publishing with National Geographic, uh, except for, and, and Sea Change, the, the um, new version has a new forward bringing things up to date after 25 years, is published by Texas A&M University. There was a tall, lean rancher in Texas who read this book and gave it to his father. His father, Ed Hart, was trying to figure out how to, to give the family fortune in a responsible way in his later years. And so his son, who got the book, said, read this book. And his father did. And one thing led to another, the power of books. <laughs> he gave $38 million to form the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M. And he said once in my presence, people all around when asked, so how is it that you came to endow th this research institute? And with generous overstatement, he said, well, she wrote the book and I wrote the check. Wow. <laughs> and the rest is history. You know, we got this now 20 year old institution turning out PhD students, exploring the Gulf of Mexico. It's very satisfying to see a direct correlation between, you know, you, you, you write not knowing what the consequences will be, <clears throat> hoping somebody's going to read it other than your editor, <laughs> well, <that's> your kids, because <laughs> they have to. <laughs> that's the amazing thing is how books can take on a life of their own and most unlike other media they get reviewed and you get interviewed and people lives are changed by the books they read and uh carl what was what was your first book and who was your publisher and how did that come about well my first book is called song for the blue ocean and it's published by henry holt company in new york um but when I was in high school and as a college student, I, I read a couple of books that I thought were unbelievably powerful. Silent Spring by Rachel Carson and a couple of other Rachel Carson books, Edward Abbey's books about, oh, Sylvia, thank you, thank you. Uh, Edward Abbey's books about his passion for the land of the, of the West um, Barry Lopez, Peter Matheson was a huge inspiration for me. And, um, and what, you know, what I felt was that a book can be a world changing thing like Silent Spring was, yeah. and it can often be a life changing thing for people. So, you know, as a young person asking, what can I do with my life that will make a difference? One answer to that question is a great book, if you can pull it off, can make a difference and can have a long life. So that was always in the back of my mind, but it was in the back of my mind because about 20 years went by when I got a environmental science degree and then I got a master's and, an eco uh, and a PhD in ecology 
I was writing science papers. I was a field ecologist. And always in the back of my mind was, I'd like to write a book someday. A lot of people say that. And then I, I got very heavily involved in fisheries policy reform, and I was doing policy work. And along the way, I started writing about conservation for, at first, a fishing newspaper. Uh, they just wrote mostly fishing reports, and I wrote little articles about conservation. And I was amazed at the response to those little articles. You know, I wrote these science papers, and I would get a very little response, and I wrote these little articles and I would get a big response and seemed to matter. So that encouraged me to do more. When I worked on the fisheries policy stuff, I wrote some policy articles and they made a difference in how fisheries policy was debated and in the passage of the Sustainable Fisheries Act, which I got very involved in also helping to write uh, a lot of the legal language in the, in the actual first draft of that uh, legislation that became law. And all this time now, uh, I had a lot of momentum thinking about uh, the fish around me, how the ocean was changing, how people were changing it, how the depletion of fish was changing the people who fish for them. And I came up with what I thought was a viable idea for a book. That, that book was published a little over 20 years ago. And... Um, to my surprise, it did very well. And my, my colleagues who I was going to all these policy meetings with, they said, you know, you should just write because you don't have to come to these meetings. We can go to the same meetings that you would come to, but uh, you know, you writing would help us at the meetings. So you should do that. And I said, that's fine with me because I kind of like doing this. And I think that it's a thing that I can uniquely contribute. You know, I can go to meetings with you and the meeting would happen with or without me. But if I write a book, that book that I write would not happen if I didn't write it. So it seemed like a worthwhile thing to do with my time. And uh, much to my surprise, really, my work took a tremendous trajectory change at that point. And since then, that's what I've been doing, writing a string of books and doing a lot of speaking related to the books and writing some articles. I still write a uh, you know, quite a few small articles that are on the web. So it was a slow process of evolution to get from a person who had been thrilled with some books as a young person to a person who writes books. You know, there was a whole, actually sort of two careers in between, a field ecologist and a policy person, policy advocate. And, and then I became, you know, what, what I am, which is I'm a person who writes a lot for a living. I, I don't really consider myself a writer in the way um, that I might if I had a, a, an English degree, you know, and like literature was my profession. Writing is my profession, but, um, but really I think of myself as a science person, think of myself as an observer, like, you know, like Sylvia was saying about Brian, you know, there are a lot of scientists who are great observers but to be a great photographer you have to be a great observer and you have to have the eye for what's in the frame so really really having you know trying to stoke and hone my powers of observation along with my sense of words on the page and my sense of the rhythm of the words on the page um, because i'm i'm a I, I am a writer that aspires to write literature, not just uh, journalism or reports. So um, I'm always trying to affect the emotional engagement of the reader. Um, because we write about conservation, a lot of what we write about is not happy all the time. There's a lot of heartache. And sometimes I say that if, if I bring you to tears on the page, then I guess I've done my job. But um, I, what I really want is for the reader to have an emotional experience. Uh, I think that's what great photography does. And that's certainly what great writing does. It is information all over the place. You don't need me for information, but I'm, right. I'm trying to convey the emotion that I feel in the extraordinary places that I'm very, very privileged to get into with the incredible people that I am very privileged to get to know. And to, as Sylvia said, to share that. And as Sylvia said, you know, the power of a book potentially 
is enormous if 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 it's a great book. So it's like I once was talking with an editor at Sierra Club Books and I was complaining as some writers complain about editors. I said a lot of editors just want to be writers and his response was, well, that's true. But then again, so do a lot of writers. <laughs> so, that's um, funny. Ryan, just like Carl was saying, he kind of likes to write. You kind of like to take pictures, which has <laughs> ended up making you maybe one of the three or four best underwater photographers in the world. Um, how'd you get into that? And how did that uh, come to be photo books that you're doing now? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks for that, um, David. And to Carl's point, I just want to say that both Carl and Sylvia certainly write with great emotion. Um, your books have, you know, stoked my, my emotions, my uh, imagination for, for so long. I mean, Song for the Blue Ocean was, was poetry when I read it uh, for the first time. I, I, I just kept rereading it and, and Sylvia's books, I mean, Sea Change, um, sitting right over there on the shelf as we speak. Uh, both, both of them are, both of your books. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great privilege. Um, you know, I, I often say that I just look at the pictures, but uh, but that's not true. I, I do like to write. Um, how it all came about for me, David, was, you know, I suppose like many of us, I fell in love with the sea as a child. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. I didn't live on the ocean at that point, um, but my parents, you know, took me to the beaches of Cape Cod and Rhode Island, New Hampshire as a child. And I can remember going home, sitting in the back seat of the car and having this sort of mix of emotions within me. On, on one hand, um, I was at peace. It was a very calming effect of having spent the day by the ocean. I was sunburned and salty and, and just very rested. Um, but another part of my brain was, was, you know, wild with imagination. I wanted to know what was going on beneath those waves. And as a kid, I read National Geographic magazine. I read, watched the Cousteau documentaries. I, I wanted to be an ocean explorer. Um, and I started scuba diving when I was about 15 years old. And it was maybe a year or two after that, that I attended a, a dive show, <clears throat> a diving show in Boston. Sylvia knows it well, the Boston Sea Rovers show where we have spoken uh, together recently. Um, but this is, it's the oldest dive show in the world. It's still going on every year in Boston. Um, members of the club include people like Sylvia Cousteau himself, you know, back in the day, Al Giddings and Dubelay and all these great people would come and, and present their work. And as a teenager, uh, newly minted diver, I was sitting in that audience and I had an epiphany. I realized that a camera was the, the way that I wanted to explore the ocean. The notion of it going around the world and diving and, and making pictures and sharing what I learned really appealed to me. It was a very lofty dream coming from this little textile mill town, but dreams do come true. And um, yeah, I chipped away at it and um, eventually got my first assignment with National Geographic, which was my dream to be a National Geographic photographer. Uh, but prior to that, I, I had written a couple of books or around that time, you know, I was doing a lot of shipwreck diving. My first book was about uh, wreck diving in 1995. And then I wrote a children's book about an orphan beluga whale up in, in Nova Scotia, Canada called A Whale on Her Own, the true story of Wilma the beluga whale. Um, but my first monograph was Ocean Soul in 2011. Um, I think I wrote 25,000 words and it was a collection of my favorite photos. Um, but it was a very personal story. And, you know, I once read some time ago that most photographers are inspired by a book, even though we, we love magazines and that's probably where most of our bread and butter comes from working for magazines, um, that there's something very special about a book. And for me, it, there was several in those days, but there was a book by a photographer named Bill Kurtzinger, who was a, a National Geographic photographer since the 1960s, he was an underwater photographer, had been in the Navy doing stuff in Antarctica of scientists under the ice. And he was a real pioneer. And um, he did this book called Wake of the Whale. It was actually written by David Brower, uh, Ken Brower, I'm sorry, David Brower's son. And um, I just read that book until the pages were worn out, you know, it came out in the late seventies and I, I, I would read it and take in a bath. I had, it had water stains on it. You know, I just, I couldn't get enough because it, it was that sort of, it, it, 
wasn't written by Bill, of course it was written by Brower, but it was all about his stories, about Bill Kurtzinger's stories. And that just fueled my passion. So, um, so when I wrote Ocean Soul, I wanted to emulate that sort of, you know, pattern where I was sharing with readers the things that I had experienced, the good and the not so good, um, as Carl pointed out, you know, there's, there's parts of that, of course, that are about the problems that I'm seeing and the sense of urgency that Sylvia described. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with Secrets of the Whales, it's, it's kind of as a storyteller, for me, a new way, um, you know, helping people see the ocean through the lens of culture. So what, what Carl has certainly written about as well, the fact that these animals have uh, complex lives, that they have ancestral traditions that they pass on from one generation to another. And, you know, using sort of the latest and greatest science to reveal human-like traits in these charismatic animals was a perfect combination for me as a storyteller to try to get at that and then to to produce the the images that would help bring people into those lives those animals lives and what sylvia once talked about is yeah what photography does it appeals to k through gray um <laughs> i know that there's a lot of uh and you said that about 50 ways to save the ocean which i appreciated a lot mm. of youth engaging now and uh, children's books bring, I mean, I remember when my nephew was 12 and calling me up and saying, Uncle David, you really have to read this book. It's really exciting. It was, um, you know, the first of, uh, of um, now I'm blanking the, um, uh -huh. the wizard. Oh, oh Harry, Harry Potter. Potter, the first Harry oh, yeah. Potter. It was very excited. He really wanted his uncle to read this and get involved in literature. And it, it got a whole new generation of youth reading. Mm. And um, I know, Carl, you've written children's books. And Sylvia, one of my favorite books relating to you is called, like, My Grandmother's an Ocean Scientist. <laughs> um, so tell us about your, your kid book, uh, Carl and uh, and Sylvia, you must have been pretty complimented that your granddaughter's writing about you. It was one of my grandsons actually who technically oh. wrote that book, and I've done five kids' books over the years. But um, I want to hear from Carl. Uh -huh. Oh well, I think it's you know it's very important to speak to everybody. So especially kids. Kids, kids are um, extremely high value targets for <laughs> trying to share the world because um, they're gonna be in the world that we make for them and then they will make the world as well. So, I mean, you can't really, can't really find a more important audience. Uh, an illustrator- children's books. I remember them, but tell us. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, an illustrator contacted me about a character that she had come up with. Her, the illustrator's name is Dawn Navarro. And um, she came up with a little character called Nina Del Mar, basically a little girl of the ocean, and wanted me to write a book, you know, that was based on Nina Del Mar. And I, I had, I just didn't have an idea of a fictional story, um, but I, I had it on the, back of my mind for a long time. And then I read this story about a whale that was tangled up in crab traps off of San Francisco. And mm -hmm. after it was freed, instead of uh, just swimming away, it went to each of the people who had been cutting the, the ropes off. And the whale had been just about drowning, really struggling to breathe. It had, uh, it had like a mile and a half of line and 600 crab traps around it. And it was just a horrible situation. Anyway, after they cut it loose, it did not just swim away. It went to each person and it just sort of nudged them with its head. Uh, and they felt that it was expressing appreciation. And then it swam in a couple of slow circles and then it disappeared. And not only is that an unbelievably great story which really is a window on the mind of the whale but um, I thought hey let's put this little kid on the boat and have her in the water helping to free this whale so that's that's what that book is about and then a, a little longer explanation of the of the actual story from the actual newspaper account in the San Francisco Chronicle 
is in the back there. And I have a couple of other children's books in the works that are um, uh, based on a couple of the other books that I've written. I have two books for, for young readers that are based on my book called Beyond Words, which is about what animals think and feel. We, we made that into two editions that are edited for young readers. So edited means, uh, you know, um, for an age range of about uh, 11 to 15 years old and uh, shortened quite a lot to make it a quicker read, illustrated with a number of photos. And um, and that's that's out in a in a become uh, in a yes a beyond words series. So there are two books in that series beyond words, and there will be a third one soon because uh, I have to deliver it at the end of I think it's the end of June. So that will be that will be out as well. And uh, we have a couple of other things on the burners. And and it sounds like you got a couple of sea dogs around you too. There are three three doggies in the room with me right now. Good Most boy. of them are quiet most of the time. <laughs> Sylvia, what about your children's books? I mean, I've, you know, I've known you since 1990. I keep learning new things. Well, I love writing the kids' books, but here's the thing. When I was 12, I read Half Mile Down by William Beebe. Yeah. It was not written for kids, but he wrote in a way that a 12-year-old could easily grasp. And I just took it in. And it, that's a book that changed my life because reading BB's descriptions of what it was like to descend half a mile beneath the surface and see this galaxy of luminous creatures, it just developed an irrepressible desire to do the same thing someday. And I wound up not only helping to design and build little submersibles, but then to use them to go down and see that galaxy of light and to share the view, a five-year period of with National Geographic, the Sustainable Seas Expeditions, getting not just scientists, but teachers and share the view with kids. That was, that was again, cause and effect. So when I write now, I, I have my 12-year-old self in mind. I have senators and um, <laughs> CEOs in mind. I hope that sea change is accessible, as accessible as Half Mile Down and other BB books were to me. It doesn't mean that you compromise the truth at all. You, 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 the, 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 you've got to keep your facts straight. It's science-based, but there's nothing wrong with trying to make it beautiful. I mean, Carl, you are so good at that. So are you, Brian. And with pictures, you know, you know how to embellish words with the right images. Mm -hmm. and, and also BB's book with the paintings, not images, not photographs, they're paintings. Underwater photography was in the 1930s, <laughs> was, was just beginning. I think the first color photograph underwater was 1927. Yeah. With Longley in the Florida Keys. Right. Yeah. And where it would look at what's happened since then. And so you can speak, you can tell stories with with images. You've done yeah. such a great job of that. But to yeah. complement it with, with words and, and well, I I, I think you get at a great point, Sylvia, that you know, these these books um that are written by folks with passion, um ignite within everybody else something else it's it's all about that ripple effect i think we we've all been touched by great literature and great pictures and paintings and we pass it on through our own passion it's it, we, you know we're not doing it for the money we're not doing it for you know for for any other reason than we're doing we are it because we can't not do it yeah <laughs> but that's that's exactly right and and that these these books have a shelf life, you know, and that's what's great. I mean, I love working uh, for magazines or National Geographic magazine. It's been a dream come true, but 
um, although that is one of the few magazines that people tend to keep um, in their attics, maybe or whatever. But you know, a book is is just so beautiful that it can it can be on the shelf and you can pick it up. I can go back and read either of your books, and it's it's like I'm reading it for the first time. Um, and and that's something special to sit with that physical contact. I think of a book, uh, you know, with a cup of tea, a cup of coffee in the afternoon or late at the night. In night, I think there's just something very special about that. It, it makes us feel good. And um, you know, when we're writing about the ocean, there's no shortage of, uh, as, as uh, David said, of good good stories about the ocean and and a sense of urgency to to share what we've learned. So, um, with words and pictures and experiences, um, we 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 pass that torch. We have that ripple effect. And let me ask you, because um, it's a question I often get asked. And, uh, you know, like this fall, last summer, I was really pitching stories to go re embed with the Coast Guard during the most active hurricane season. And instead, I ended up actually for National Geographic leaving my house to cover the California wildfires that were pretty much just outside my door. So, one thing I learned is you no longer have to travel for the climate emergency. It's coming to a neighborhood near you. Mm -hmm. And um, I did what I always do, you know, spend a night with the firefighters, get home, immediately transcribe my notes to my computer because even after 24 hours, I start having a hard time reading my uh, handwriting in my reporter's notebooks. Um, but people always say, how do you write? I, I write best when I get to the final versions between like 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. when it's kind of quiet. Um, do you have particular times or environments where you write best, or in Brian's case, when you edit your photos best? Um, you know, for, for me, it, it, no, not necessarily a time of the day, um, but I do like a quiet place. Um, I've been doing a little bit of writing now, and I I go to, uh, I, I leave the house actually, I go to a, a little cottage we have on our property and I sit in there, it's very quiet and peaceful. And um, I usually start with, you know, a yellow legal pad and I make some notes and I sort of outline the things that I think are important, what sort of themes or narratives I, I feel are sort of important and try different things and some work and some don't uh, in terms of the writing part. Um, and then, you know, once I feel like it's beginning to take shape and I'm, I mean, I'm literally writing with a pen and, and paper, uh, with some of that. And then, then Did I'll take a break. What's that? Did your quill break? <laughs> yeah, my quill, exactly. Uh, and then I'll take to the computer and, and, you know, once I feel like I'm doing that, I've, I've, I've been doing that. I've been um, asked to, to give a commencement speech at a university, um, next month. And, um, so I've been doing that. I, I go and just sort of scribble it out on, on paper and see where it's going before I put it in official form on the computer. But um, as far as editing photos, I do that usually daily as I come back from the field, if I'm on a boat or, or in a hotel room or right now in my studio here, I'll come back and download and edit that night and then, you know, go back and look at them when I have some time and, and re-edit. But fortunately with Geographic, I'm sending in hard drives and I have a photo editor who We'll go through with Secrets of the Whales. I think in, in the three years that I worked on that, I shot just, just under 150,000 frames. And my editor will, thank goodness, go through every single one or did go through every single one. So um, we don't try not to miss anything. So, yeah. God, that's a lot of rolls of film. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, it would have been. It would have been. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been nearly as many rolls of film if it had been using film. Yeah. Carl, where, where and when do you like to do your writing? Well, I, I like to do my writing in my writing studio, which is uh, very similar to Brian, a little cottage at the back of our backyard. And uh, early morning, very early morning, sometimes, uh, sometimes from the dark into the dawn, otherwise, you know, as early as I can, up until, up until about early afternoon, I, I, I have a sort of an energy slump in the middle of the afternoon. That's when I usually work on my emails. And then I like to write from about seven to about 10 or 11 is also a good time for me. If I try to take it much later than that, 
I, I like the atmosphere of writing really late, you know, past midnight, but it takes it out of the next day for me. So that's basically the rhythm that I stay on. Uh, I usually sit in the chair for about two, two and a half hours at a time. And then I have some excuse to get up. I need more tea. Uh, I have to get a snack. The chickens need food. The dogs need to be let out. Some, some excuse like that. And then I go and sit down again. So the morning writer versus the night owl writer, although in your case, the night owl subject. <laughs> the, the night owls are the actual subject, right, exactly. And Sylvia, what, when do you, I mean, yeah, tell us about your writing best place and I'm betting airplanes is not one of them. No, when absolutely pressured to get something, you know, deadlines, I, I, you know, but that, that's not my best writing. You know, it's not just words on a page. That's what I keep telling those who say, you've got to get it out by next Tuesday. Not just words on a page. I can get lots of words down, but that's not what anybody really wants. So I agree with Carl and Brian having a quiet place. Actually, I, I used to think it was just, just um, not necessarily true that early morning is a, a good time to be creative. But I find, especially during this past year, when I'm actually in one place and I can really have something like a, quote, normal life <laughs> schedule, um, early morning it, it tends to be the time when I come up with some of the best lines. I also like to retreat into the night. But as Carl points out, that means that <laughs> you get caught in the squeeze. You, 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 uh, if you stay up late, you don't get up refreshed early in the morning. So anyway. So Natasha, we've got about 15 minutes left. Do you have, uh, have you been looking at the questions that you can uh, ask Brian, Carl or Sylvia? Yes, um, we've been getting a few, a few really good questions here. Let's start from the top. Um, uh, this one was for uh, Brian. Um, are, is there a, a specific story or photograph that has really um, hold significant for you that uh, that kind of guided some of your work? Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question refers to photos or stories of my own or from somebody else. Um, you know, if I'll, I'll sort of briefly answer it either way, just in case. Um, you know, I was definitely inspired by the work of many nature photographers. You know, when I was young, looking at their work um, in in the pages of a magazine like National Geographic. So certainly, underwater photographers, guys like Louis Martin and Bill Kurtzinger, David Dubelay, Flip Nicklin. Um, you know, larger than life. I mean, this stuff really, really inspired me and spoke to me. Um, and and their books as well, uh, Water, Light, Time by Dubelay and and Wake of the Whale. Um, by Kurt Sanger. So those did, and, and non-underwater photographers as well, um, guys like Jim Brandenburg, Chris Johns, Nick Nichols, um, you know, maybe a generation earlier than me that were, were doing really amazingly adventurous stuff that inspired me. Um, in terms of my own work, and if there was a, a, it's hard to pick photos that, you know, are my favorite, but there's been a couple of images that I've made that come to mind that I think have resonated with people. Um, one at either end of the spectrum. Um, I made a picture years ago while doing a cover story on the global fisheries crisis um, uh, for National Geographic. And it was a photo of a, of a dead thresher shark in a gill net that um, I saw in the Sea of Cortez early one morning. I jumped in, I was swimming along the gill net and, the shark had just recently died, its eye was still open. And because it's a pelagic animal, it had these you know, big pectoral fins. And as I framed it up in my camera's viewfinder, it, it struck me as a crucifixion. And I thought that maybe that would give some empathy to the staggering statistic of 100 million plus sharks being killed every year. It became the lead picture in that cover story. And it went on to be used um, by a lot of conservation NGOs uh, to stop shark finning. So that's one. Another photo um, was a photo I made of a southern right whale 
uh, on the bottom of the ocean next to my assistant. It was a story I did on right whales com comparing and contrasting the beleaguered North Atlantic population with their southern cousins. And, and these were a population of whales in the sub-Antarctic that had never seen humans before. They were very curious. And um, I was diving alone for the first few days because I didn't want even one other person in the water. I was afraid that we would scare the whales. But after a few days of making some images, felt pretty good about that. I had this picture of a human and whale together and you never know if that's gonna unfold, but it did that day. Um, and I think, you know, that has also resonated with people. I think it's something about the sort of look of having a conversation between a human and a whale, you know, this silhouetted figure um, with this 45 foot long 70 ton whale on the bottom of the ocean. So we've reproduced it in, in Secrets of the Whales, the new book, um, the latest and greatest color correction on it. But, you know, I think for very different reasons, each of those pictures, um, you know, had some some impact with with readers. Great, thank you. And Carl, a question for you. Um, have you ever experienced any criticism from some of your more academically con uh, conservation colleagues on some of your writings um, or had it, you know, in terms of your writing style? This is, this is my worst critic right here. <laughs> <laughs> she always thinks I'm never paying enough attention to her. Um, no, I've been very surprised that the opposite has happened. Uh, uh, quite a few people who are Scientists and academics have uh, sort of come out of the woodwork to tell me that they really liked something that I've written. Um, you know, I wasn't expecting that. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and then I've been invited to be on the faculty um, at different times of s several really good universities, Yale, Duke, uh, right now Stony Brook, where I have an endowed chair there. So no, quite the opposite. I was expecting a lot of pushback and uh, it, it hasn't happened, quite the opposite, I'm happy to say. Great, thank you. And this is kind of a question for all of you, but I'll start with Sylvia. Is there, you know, as, as you store, you're all storytellers, is there a fear of oversaturating people with kind of the, the crisis and the urgency of our environment? And if so, what can we do to keep audiences engaged and not and oversaturate uh, them with with the doom and gloom. And Sylvia, why don't you uh, take us first? Okay, well, let me say about that, that I think I purposefully couple any of the bad news with the positive side. There's always, you know, you, you've got to know what the problems are, but the good news is we know what the problems are. Imagine if we didn't know. And I have been able to communicate, I think, over with the graduations and books and all the rest, that this is the best time ever to be alive because we're armed with knowledge. Things that no one knew when I was a kid, we now know. Whether it's the climate change issue, the capacity to alter the nature of nature, it once seemed impossible, but now we know. And so we've got a chance. If, if, if we didn't know, we just keep on doing the same old stupid things that we've been doing all along. And we still are, but as long as we know, there's cause for hope. And there's cause for hope too, because you can see that when we stop the killing and start the caring, recovery is possible. More whales today than when I was a kid. More manatees today. More sea turtles today. I mean, there are fewer of a lot of things and there are no more oh, of the the little uh, seals that once were in the Gulf of Mexico. The last ones were seen when I was in high school. The Caribbean monk seal, gone. Bad news, good news. There's still two other species of monk seals and although they're in trouble, we still have some, still have 10% of the sharks. Well, bluefin tuna, Huh. The latest figures are less than 3% in the Pacific of the adult tunas, the reproducing tunas. That should be cause to say stop, but we're still eating bluefin tuna from the Pacific and the Atlantic and elsewhere. But at least we've got the evidence and 
there's a growing voice. And Carl's certainly one of the strong ones about fish or wildlife. These are not just commodities. We need to think about life in the ocean as wildlife and to create an ethic that transcends just looking at the numbers and looking at the dollar signs on everything that swims in the ocean. So I wanted to just very quickly address the issue about that you, you asked Carl, because when I was asked by the National Geographic back in 1970 to write a story about living underwater, having been part of this team of aquanauts spending two weeks underwater, I'm a scientist. I was at Harvard University. I was not going to write for National Geographic because I might be branded as a popularizer. And that was, you know, by my ivory tower colleagues. It took, you know, pacing around for a couple of weeks before I, you know, finally climbed out of the ivory tower and said, okay, I would write the article. I mean, when I think about it now, I think, what a, what a stupid attitude to have had that that I, my loftier than now scientific colleagues might have thought less for me. Actually, Carl Sagan did take a hit for popularizing quotes, but he never compromised his science. And that's the key. As long as you don't exaggerate, or if you do, you say you're exaggerating, you're telling a story to tell the truth. That's okay too. But it's 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 tricky. But as long as you stick to that that quality of of really understanding that we're we're you don't sink into exaggeration or if you do you're telling a story like jaws <laughs> it was a great story it wasn't the truth so i think the, I think the great the great scientists are remembered for what they had to say to the public rachel carson Albert Einstein, Carl Sagan, Sylvia. There, there are plenty of people who w didn't want to speak to the public because they thought it was beneath them and nobody remembers them. <laughs> they effectively had nothing to say. Um, so I, I, think that, I think that speaks volumes in itself right there. You, know, you remember the people who, who want to share what they know. And I think the, the challenge for journalists, authors, photographers, especially covering the you know cascading disasters that our ocean is facing is to find that way to balance the wonder and the warnings. Because um, the old saying, you, you protect what you love. And there's so much to love and be awe-inspired by you know, we're discovering new worlds in the ocean, even as we're putting them at risk. And, and this is another reason why people read books is, is literally you can get in depth um, and lose yourself in another world. So if you're, if you, for whatever reason, aren't able to join Sylvia or Brian or Carl in or under the water, you can experience it through uh, that, that empathy that books create. And, um, Again, the, the, the books that everybody listening should read and tell all their friends to pick up. Um, I guess the new one, Secrets of the Whales, is out when, Brian? April 6th, available now for pre-order. Yeah. Great. And you're not sure, do you know exactly when your, uh, your book, The Global Odyssey, Ocean's Global Odyssey, is coming out, Sylvia? October. October, but... Of this year. <laughs> of this year, but but you don't have to wait because no. next week you can get uh, um, you can get the 25th anniversary of sea change. It's yes, that's right. With and of course color Carl this time. <laughs> and becoming wild is is doing great. It's it's literally swimming, jumping, and flying off the shelves. It's it's, <laughs> it's coming out in paperback paperback in April. Wonderful. So um, just to get in on the band bandwagon of having a book this year, the paperback version is coming out in April. And, you know, I wanted to just add that all, all of us work from love. 
And to the extent that we feel heartache and grief, that's the other side of love. That's, that's why we're at this, because we all fell in love with the world. And not, not because we want to share a lot of bad news, because we want to share the love that we have had and have. Yeah. And that's, that's a lovely point to get out on. We have two minutes. If you've enjoyed the discussion, uh, please join Writers for the Sea. Go to the Facebook page and you'll, we'll keep you up to date. I'm thinking uh, this is lovely. Maybe our next one will be on uh, a sea of fiction because we've got some great novelists writing about the sea. We, we, you know, we started Writers for the Sea with a quote from uh, Henry David Thoreau saying, who hear the fishes, who hears the fishes when they cry? And clearly Brian, Carl, and Sylvia are among those who very much do and exchange that. And I, I hope uh, at, on the political front, Sylvia will be joining hundreds of us on April 14th, uh, for the uh, Ocean Climate Action Lobby, largest virtual lobby in history. If you want to know more about that, Ocean Climate Action 2021. And uh, I just want to thank you all. Read their books. Read mine too. Um, so thank you, Brian, Carl, Sylvia. All right. Thank technical end. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. And, th and thanks, everybody who tuned in for sharing your valuable evening with us. And it will all be posted shortly and when the video is online we'll let folks know great thank you thank you oceans of love <laughs> exactly bye everyone <laughs>